Hard to keep up with Tony, but I, I'll tell you, but I'll try. Um, lovely to be here, and I'm talking about the two passions, which will be hard to compress into 15 minutes. Here's a letter. Dearest X, how I miss you. I pray I never have to leave you forever. You would think that a letter like that, written in the 1940s during the war, would be written by a young man to his lover. In a sense, it was. It was my father writing to the house that, thanks Alex, we can see here. Um, and this was the love of his life. He wasn't born to own this house. He was sent here when he was two years old by his parents who were sent off to Bolivia where they thought it was unwise to take a small child. And so they dumped him here with childless relatives, old Lord and Lady Byron, and my father was bewitched by this place. That I never solved in my memoir. I do not know what it was that entranced him so, but living there, I can kind of guess. Um, from the age of seven, he was writing letters that rather solemnly and charmingly said, when I am the squire of Thrumpton Hall, I will care for my people. I will foster their interest in the church and I will see that the radiators are warm. Um, he had absolutely fixed in his mind the idea that he, the youngest son of cousins, would somehow come to own a hundred rum house that had nothing really very much to do with him. And it's kind of an education and a passion that determination can see you through. My father fixed his eyes on this idea and he never let go of it. In 1945, at the end of the war, old Lord Byron, by that time old, tired, with no children, was exhausted, fed up with Thrumpton. They'd got no, nobody to look after them. The garden was all going to rot. And he said, I'm going to sell it. Wait, said my father from a distance. Wait, I will find the money. I will save the house. And my father found, and I think also fell in love, with a young woman who was the daughter of one of the richest men in England, Lord Howard de Walden. He married her, my mother. Um, the marriage was happy, but the marriage was really centered upon their mutual devotion for this house. And briefly, I want to say that it was a heroic endeavor for anybody who has read about houses in the post-war period of that size, 1946. There was nobody who would come and work in them. They were enormous. They had these vast gardens, vast parks, nobody to do a thing. So it was a labor of love by my parents. But it was also my father's ideal and dream he was an insecure young man, and everything in his life was fixed on the idea that this house would bring him a kind of life that he'd longed for, that distant relations contacted, dukes, princes, archdukes, God knows, all of this would come through owning a house like this. Um, we started rather quietly with Alex. This is the modest days of my mother, I, and my brother, sitting quite quietly outside, and life went along like this. But this was not my father's dream. My father's dream comes next. This is where we are seated triumphantly in the family drawing room upstairs. And um, one of my father's projects was that his rather dumpy wife and his very stout daughter should slim down, which we've done by now. And also, our hair was very unsatisfactory, so we should wear wigs. We're both wearing our wigs, and looking pretty good in them, I think, really. But even this had not achieved what my father had hoped for. Still, the Duchess of Devonshire had failed to respond to his invitations to come and admire his home. Still, the Duke of Portland only occasionally asked him to tea. We had not pulled off the trick that he had hoped for. In 1964, a terrible thing happened to my father. A power station arrived on the other side of the hill, right in sight of his beautiful home, dashing his hopes. Now the Duchess of Devonshire would never come at all. It was quite certain. Nevertheless, he summoned up the good cheer to give his daughter um, a 
Honda 50 for her 16th birthday, me. And we haven't got tonight a very cheerful picture of me, bewigged, sitting on my Honda 50, looking very jolly. The only time I got to ride it, because my father said, I'd rather like to try that myself. Got on it, and we didn't see him again for two days. He came back with a, an enormous black Laverda bike and a young man who he said would help him to drive it. Um, from then on, life at Thrumpton became something altogether different. Um, my father would take, first of all, girls on his bike, then he took my small son, um, aged eight there, um, doing 100 miles an hour down the M1. Um, you can see how well my son is protected, how many, many belts and things are keeping him safely in place. I was hysterical. From then on, um, life became more bizarre. My father needed um, young men who would be able to lift the bike up if it fell over, put new wheels on, do all that kind of stuff. But it also became clear that he needed young men to reassure him and perhaps to share with him a childhood he had never really known. Um, I'm kind of steering around the fact that in about um, 16 years after he started his biking life, he went to a film in Leicester Square and in a queue met the love of his life. Um, not the kind of man we would ever have seen at Thrumpton before. This was Robbie. And Robbie came to live with us for 16 years. Um, it was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> It, it wasn't really what any of us had looked for, but my father, my father was extremely happy and so was Robbie, and my mother did an awful lot of gardening. <laughs> um, life went on, I went away, my brother went away, Robbie remained, and here I'm afraid the story turns black. Um, my father was, in fact, it's hard to believe, but he was deeply, deeply in love, humiliatingly for my mother. He was more in love with Robbie than he had ever been with any of us. This was good food, passion. Robbie couldn't stand having to be completely under my father's command in the way that everything at Thrumpton had to be. And to cut a long story short, I got a call one night from my weeping father to say, uh, three in the morning, it was terrible, I was in London, that Robbie had taken my father's shotgun and blown his brains out. And I've never so much believed that cancer can be caused by grief as when my father died five months later. Um, this was the dreadful end to my father's life. Um, it, it was a heartbreaking end to the whole story of Thrumpton. And yet, if we can go back, cheer ourselves up to the picture of Thrumpton, which continues still. My problem was that I could not get rid of the ghost of my father. He haunted the house, he haunted my mind, he haunted my mother. He was there everywhere. We buried him in the garden and put up without irony a tablet that said, where you look, there I will be, and there he always was. I wrote the memoir as a form of exorcism, but of course I shared the house with my mother. I share it with her still. We do, my husband and I. My husband's out there somewhere. And um, it was a great problem to write a book about your father with your mother there, loving him, hating him, wanting me to write the book, not wanting me to write the book. And this was, I think, the most difficult book I have ever had to do. And I ended up by doing it in despair, introducing my mother into the book as my conscience. I put in one line from her when she said, I really don't see the point. This is all a great deal of rubbish. You don't need to write this book. And it was the most living thing in the entire memoir. And from that point on, I thought, that's what I'm going to do. My mother is going to be in the book, correcting me, reproving me. And her voice will be the voice that makes my voice sound real. And the extraordinary thing at the end of the book was that my mother saw nothing of it the whole way through. She was very brave. She said she would put up with my just getting on with it and take me on trust. And after we had done our first interview together and my mother had been asked how it felt to be married to a homosexual sitting with me in the room and she still hadn't read the book, so you can picture that for courage. Um, she said, I would now like to read the book. 
She took it off to her room on Christmas Eve, and she didn't come down until the next evening when she said, I would like a very large glass of whiskey and fixed me with a very, very stony stare. And I thought, oh my goodness. And I gave her a very large whiskey, and she said, I think I'd like another. She's never had two whiskeys. This was very, very well, the whole future of this book was at risk. And um, I'm sorry I'm thinking more about the book than about my mother, but that's the way it is with writers, I'm sure you understand. Um, anyway, finally, in a terrified voice, I said, so what did you think of it? And she said, my dear, you got it all wrong. <laughs> And I said, where should we start? What? Um, I, all wrong? And she said, I never had freckles. <laughs> and my nail varnish wasn't always chipped. And I said, but you said it's all wrong. What, what was wrong? And she said, isn't that enough? <laughs> End of story. Thank you so much.